In this video I'll be using some animations to show how various kinds of beam engines worked. These were the very first steam engines that were used commercially. So this started in 1712. And this is a beam engine because it has a rocker beam across the top, sometimes called a walking beam, like walking down the road. And uh, on the left hand end of the beam it has a piston pump which is pumping water out of a mine. Actually, in the early ones, they had a chain connecting these so that you could not actually push down on the piston, but you could lift it up. On the right-hand side, we have the actual engine part, and this also has a cylinder with a, with a green piston in it. And underneath that, we have a boiler with a yellow fire burning underneath it, producing steam. Now, this is very low-pressure steam, so it's not actually doing any work when the steam enters here. So the steam comes in as the piston comes up and it's actually drawn up by the weight of the water and the pump uh, and the weight on the side basically pulling it down on the left and lifting the piston on the right. So let's have a look at the um, steps of this animation. So the steam has gone into the cylinder and when it's filled then the red valve at the bottom closes. These T-shaped things are valves which can open and close. Notice that the settings on the pump, the uh, two valves on the pump, have switched. And now the water jet opens at the top right-hand corner of the cylinder here, spraying water into the steam. This cools the steam down and causes it to condense into water. When that happens, the volume changes dramatically, um, this steam reduces to one eleven hundredth of the volume when it condenses into water, or conversely, if water turns into steam, it expands 1100 times. So when we make it condense by cooling it down, it decreases in volume and we end up with what we think of as a vacuum inside the cylinder here, and that sucks the piston down, like this. But in actual fact, suction really isn't a force so much, as what's actually driving the piston down is atmospheric pressure pushing on the top of the piston. So the air pressure is pushing on the top and there's no air pressure on the bottom. And so the air pressure is pushing the piston down. And this is atmospheric pressure, 14.7 pounds per square inch. And that's why it's called an atmospheric engine. It's actually using atmospheric pressure to drive it, which they understood well. So when it finally gets to the bottom. The uh, bottom steam valve opens and it starts filling with steam again. Here we go. Get to the top, squirt, pull it down, sucks the piston down, now it's filling with steam again, squirt, pull it down. As the valves are opening and closing, and you can notice that the pump valves on the left are opening and closing appropriately to provide the pumping action. Filling with water, Draining water, filling with water, draining water. Well, on the right hand side we're filling with steam and contracting the steam. So that's it, that's the new common atmospheric engine. The next development was Bolton and Watt's beam engine in 1782. Notice that this is 70 years later and by then about 1500 of the new common engines were already in use in mines all around England and other parts of the world. Now, James Watt was asked to repair one of these new common engines and when he looked at it he discovered that he could improve on it. He realized that the problem is that as the steam comes into the cylinder on the right hand side it, has, it heats the cylinder up and then when we squirt the water in to cool it down we have to cool the whole cylinder down again so you're constantly heating and cooling the cylinder and this process takes time and slows the machine down and also decreases efficiency. So he decided to separate these two processes and have the boiler, which is now like I put on the right hand side. So they've got a fire underneath the boiler here making steam. So that's the hot side. And on the bottom here, we've got a condenser, which is kept cool to make the steam condense and turn into water. So we've got, in his case, actually a reasonably high pressure, of, I should say a moderate high pressure of steam. It wasn't really high pressure, which is used later in other steam engines, so, so I would call it a moderate pressure. 
but you have got some pressure coming on the top of the piston pushing it down from the steam pressure while at the same time you've got a vacuum on the underside pulling it down which is really atmospheric pressure so let's see how this works steam coming in pushing the piston down pulling water up on the left hand side on the pump and then the steam valve gets turned off on the right hand side here the steam valve has just been closed and so now the steam that's in there is trapped the um, pump valves over here are switching and the bypass tracked valve is opened so now as a piston comes up it's really doing nothing in terms of work because all it's doing is transferring the steam from the top side of the piston through this channel into the bottom side of the piston and that since the pressure is the same on both sides it's not able to do any work it's just transferring the steam from one side to the other once it gets there then with the valves change again and uh, we'll see what happens next so now the steam's coming in pushing the piston down with the valve closed now the um, transfer valve is opened transferring the steam from the top to the bottom close it push in new steam from the top pushing it down vacuum pulling it down as well when it gets to the bottom the valves close again this way our valve is closed so we can now at this point start emptying all the water that's accumulated in the condenser Okay, running at a good speed now. It's probably it's actually a bit faster than they really ran. They did about six to twelve cycles per minute. So six would be ten seconds per cycle. This is going a bit faster than that. This animation is a Cornish beam engine, which is essentially the same as the Watts engine in this presentation but with one minor change you'll see in a minute. It still relies on moderate steam pressure. I call it high steam pressure, but it's not as high as they used later. Moderate, shall we say, steam pressure on the top of the piston, providing some thrust, and a vacuum on the underside of the piston. So it's got um, forces on both sides of the piston pulling it down. And as that occurs, it pulls the water up out of the mine. So from that point of view, it's still the same. And we'll run through the steps. So steam is applied from the boiler on the right hand side, pushing the piston down, same as before. Only when it gets to this point, the steam valve closes. And the steam that's trapped in there is allowed to expand, pushing the piston down. As the piston goes down, the pressure does decrease, but there's still a good positive pressure pushing on the piston until it gets all the way to the bottom. And you've got the vacuum on the bottom as well. When we get to the bottom, the valves change again. The uh, pump settings reverse. And this bypass track opens up. So now we have a passive stroke that doesn't do any work. And all we're doing is transferring steam from the top side of the piston to the bottom side. And when it gets there, then the uh, valves change again. The bypass track closes, pump system reverses, and as the piston comes down, the water, the water under the steam underneath converts to water and contracts in the condenser chamber. Now we've got another passive stroke. Now we've got a power stroke with steam from the top expanding. And the advantage of this is that only a small amount of steam is used. And so it makes the machine a lot more efficient. There is a decrease in power, but the efficiency makes it worthwhile. If you really need more power, you can leave the steam valve open a little bit longer. And that's how locomotives work. They'll use uh, steam throughout the stroke when they're first accelerating, but once they're up to speed, cruising speed, they'll um, set it to just a small amount of steam with each stroke and run much more efficiently.
At this point, I've uh, not mentioned two other improvements or changes that James Watt made. Unfortunately, somebody had patented the crank, the type like a pedal on a bicycle type of arrangement that had been patented. So James Watt couldn't use it. So instead, he came up with this gear system where we've got two gear wheels on the right rotating around each other, and that fixed the patent issue. On the left hand side, the early engines actually had a chain which connected to, to the piston to stop it from twisting sideways and wanted to deal with the problem that the fact that an, a, a beam makes an arc, a curve. And when you push the piston down, it can make the piston shaft move from side to side and pre prevent it from sealing properly or make it stick. So he wanted to translate this curved motion into a straight motion and he achieved that with this complicated looking linkage. Very nice solution to the problem and he was very proud of this. Thought it was his best invention. Which oh, it's too. And we can simplify this a bit actually. Here's a, a simplified version. So we've got two yellow rods of the same length uh, creating arcs around circular curves but the bar be connecting one to the other draws a perfectly straight line and so we connect our piston to that center point and actually i saw one that was exactly this design in a photograph this is a photograph i came across at cross nets sewerage pumping station in england and noticed that it had exactly the same linkage not the same as Watts, but the simplified kind of version. Now we're going to see some steam engines actually running, some beam engines. These ones actually have cranks on them rather than the Watt gear system, otherwise very similar. And these can be seen at Cubridge Steam Museum near London. the flying ball governor at the top and the balls swing out the machine's running too fast and it cuts off the steam supply or reduces the steam supply so it regulates the speed of the machine.